Rub up your engines! Today we're going to check out a Honda that's burning a little bit of engine oil in between oil changes. Now yes it is 12 years old, has 120,000 miles on it. A lot of times engine will burn a little bit of oil just from age. Well we're going to figure out why. Now my customer here, they're the original owner of the car and they've never had the PCV valve changed. We're going to pray that that's most of the problem. Now here's how a PCV valve works, it stands for positive crankcase ventilation. The pistons go up and down and they throw pressure into the crankcase. Well that pressure has to go somewhere. When I was a young mechanic, they just vented it to the atmosphere, it just had a little pipe and it would puff out of there. But alas, that pollutes the atmosphere. So now they have these PCV valves that vent the air pressure from inside the crankcase and run it back into the engine and burn it. Now here's a new valve, you can hear it rattle. Because it's got a little valve inside. It will suck vapors, but if oil gets in there, the valve shuts so oil doesn't get sucked and burned. When they get old, a lot of times that system breaks down then they'll suck oil and then burn it. It's a simple system if you know where to look. On a Honda, here's the intake and here's the PCV hose and then down on the end of it here, this valve is inside there. So we just have to take the hose off and unbolt it. So you get the pliers and we grab the little spring and pull it out. It's a circlip that holds the hose on. And you can see now, there it is, we got it off. Now we have to pry the hose off. Wiggle the heck out of it and it will come off. And as you can see, the prying's working. Huh. There it goes, got it off. Sometimes nothing's better than brute force. Do like I do, buy the valve first. Then you can see which deep well socket fits on it. In this case, a 17 millimeter deep well socket. We'll unscrew the old one, then screw the new one in. There it is, and with the right tools, it's an easy job. And out it comes. Just remember, it's got a little gasket on it, reuse that gasket. Because you can see the new one doesn't come with a gasket. We got to take this gasket off. If you just put it on like this, it might suck air and leak and cause mean running conditions. Just get a little pliers, take it off. Then you just screw it back in the hole. I'm using a little flashlight because even I can't see very well down in there. There's not much working room, but if you work on a cold engine, you're not going to burn yourself. So you just have to keep turning it until it threads itself in. Now it has. And we'll just finish screwing it in by hand and give it a little turn with the wrench. Just give it a good solid turn. It's still turning. Then when it's snug, just a little more. Then we get the hose end here and slip it on. You can't see it while I'm doing it, but now you can see it slipped on and there's the clip. We just have to snap the clip on. And that's impossible to film in that room, so we're just grabbing a clip with the pliers and slipping it on. But now you can see the clip is in place and it holds it from falling off. Now we're going to hope that that fixes the oil burning, but we're going to do a test to see what shape the engine is because it does have over 100,000 miles on it. So we're going to do a wet and dry compression test. You got to take the stupid cover off. That covers the spark plug holes. And once we get it off, we got to take the coil on plugs off. They also screw out and come off. We're going to take all the coil on plugs out and all the spark plugs out. All four of them. There, now they're all out. Now we're going to do a compression test. And we want all four spark plugs out so it's tested exactly the same. We'll test one cylinder at a time. Just crank the engine. Now some guys are nuts. They'll say step on the gas to let more air in, blah, blah, blah. As long as you just turn the key alone to do the test on each cylinder, each one will be tested correctly. We don't care about the actual pressure. We care about the difference in pressure for this test. We want to see if the pressure goes up a whole bunch when we add a little oil in showing worn piston rings. Now you screw this part in to do the compression test and here's a tip. Get a little WD-40 and spray the end so it's lubricated and it goes in smoother. Then you stick it in a number one cylinder and you turn it until it's snug. There. Now it's snug. Then we connect the gauge, it snaps on here, and crank it over. And as we see on the gauge, 170 PSI. Then we let the pressure out, unscrew this, and pour about a cap of engine oil in there. Little bit of oil, pour it in. Then we screw the gauge back in, get it nice and snug, then hook it up and crank it again. And what do we have? 5 PSI more than it was before. Now for a vehicle that's got over 100,000 miles on it, that's not that bad. Yes, the piston rings are worn a little because the oil 
seals them better. If it was a brand new engine, it wouldn't make any difference. Pistons are sealing perfectly well, and an extra seal wouldn't do anything because they're already sealed. That little bit isn't that bad. But now, of course, we got to check the other three. Got to check them all. You got to be scientific with this stuff. Now, as you can see here, the cylinder's a little bit weaker. It's about 155 pounds. And when we add a little bit of oil, and in this case, what's the magic number? It went over 180. So, those rings are worn more. So, in reality, this engine's got some wear in it. And of course, when the rings are worn, it's going to burn more oil. But since it's only burning a quart of oil every so often, you live with that. Personally, I just change it more often. The customer's using extended oil every 15,000 miles. I would use good quality oil like Castro, and I change it every 5,000. Now I checked the other two cylinders, and they were pretty much the same as the others. One of them went from 160 to 175. One of them was 175. It went to 180. So the number two cylinder is actually worn the most. They're all worn a little bit. Hey, when you look at the spark plug, we'll do a close-up. There's only a tiny amount of oil burning on it. They're not coated with carbon. They just have little spots. So it's not outrageous. So that you know how to check out a car that's burning oil and what you can do to slow it down. And here's some bonus questions and answers. Chief Pontiac says, Scotty, how good are these oil life monitors on some of the newer cars? I got the system on my Pontiac. I am not a fan of oil monitoring systems because I've seen them break. I've seen them where they never tell somebody to change their oil, and in some cases, it was ladies that went by that, and the engines got destroyed because they never changed the oil because it never told them to. And I've seen the reverse happen. The stupid things will tell people every 500 miles it's time to change their oil because the systems break. You're dealing with computer sensors. All that stuff is going to break down as it ages. You go by mileage or you go by change it once a year if you drive less than 5,000 miles a year. That's the way to go. Do not trust those stupid computer systems when it comes to stuff like that. It's just like some cars have an oil level monitor that tells you when the oil is supposedly low. Well, that's just a little sensor. I've seen them break and leak oil, which you don't want, and I've seen them break but not leak oil not tell you when it's actually low. So, I don't trust any of that computer stuff. I like having things you can actually check and going by mileage or time, or if you look at it and it's really dirty, rather than trusting some stupid computer system that somebody designed that has many failure points that often fail. Acorn25 says, Scotty, is it okay to change the differential fluid in my 91 Chevy Silverado two-wheel drive? It's been sitting for 12 years. Sure, realize Differential fluid is in your differential. That's splash lubrication. The gears just spin around, and they all get sucked from the bottom to the top and splashes around. Change it now. It's probably really dirty. Most guys forget about it and don't do anything, and then eventually it gets all gunked up and destroys it, and then you got to get another rear end. Same thing with the standard transmission. Splash lubrication. You can always change it. Now, automatic transmissions, if they get dirty and you change dirty stuff, you can have problems because they have oil pumps in them, and they go by friction drive. The friction of the fluid drives an automatic transmission, and if you put in fresh new fluid on a really old one, a lot of times they'll start to slip. That won't happen in a standard transmission or differential, so change it now. Kind of write it down. It's a good idea to change it every 60, 70,000 miles or something like that. Write it in a book and then just do it every once in a while, because a little maintenance like that, the fluid's going to cost you maybe 20 bucks or less. You can easily do it yourself. Then you don't have to worry about a $1,500 rear end going out. Talk about it, Seth Scott. I got a 2009 Toyota Sienna. It makes a clicking almost clunky noise like two metal only when I put it in reverse. What could be wrong? Let's pray it's not your transmission going out because that costs a fortune. But the Siennas, they're not known for transmission problems. A lot of times it's something a lot simpler. One of the CV joints might be wearing out. When you drive, you're normally going forwards. The CV joints turn in one direction. Well, when you back up, they're turning the opposite direction. If there's a little bit of wear, a lot of times they'll clunk just going backwards. Always check the obvious things first. So you got a friend around, have the friend step on the brake, put it in reverse when you have the hood open and watch, and then you can hear the clunk better because you'll be able to be under the hood and you can listen. And if you see that 
mounts moving, replace it. Pray that it's not the transmission going out. Normally not in a Toyota. If it was a Chrysler, I'd say how the transmission's probably going out. But on a Toyota, there's not really a problem with that. So, guy, hot suit dude says, Scotty, did the typical full-size American car of the 80s last significantly longer than its 70s counterpart? No. And here's the main reason. Of course, over time, a lot of the American manufacturers have gone down, especially Chrysler and GM. But in the 70s, Americans were making cars that at least they knew how to make. They were bigger cars, and they were almost all rear-wheel drive. In the 80s, Americans started really getting into front-wheel drive cars. Americans didn't know squat about making front-wheel drive cars. They handled like crap. The transmissions would burn out because they used the prototypical American bigger engines. They had a lot of power, and then they put these little front-wheel drive transmissions. They couldn't take that power, and they would burn out. So actually, a 70s American car, it'll generally run circles around an 80s American car for how long the thing is going to last. Now, most of them, yes, were gas hogs in the 70s. So, you know, you want a toy, go ahead and get one. But an everyday driver, you better have a lot of money for gasoline. Because a lot of those 70s cars, you know, they'd get 10 miles a gallon in town and maybe 15 on the highway from when I was a young mechanic working on them. They were pretty much gas hoggy, but they did last a lot better than the 80s American cars did that were probably one of the worst American cars ever made in the 1980s. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.